pretty bad. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm Mike Scher, GJH board member, and it is my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, our speaker tonight came over from Rexburg, Forrest Gahn, who has done, this is his second talk for us. Uh, he has been a professor there at BYU Rexburg for 13 years or more. Yeah, about 13 years. And uh, Boris grew up in Burlington, Iowa, went to BYU Rexburg for his uh, undergrad in geology, his bachelor's from uh, BYU, uh, from University of Cincinnati, and then the PhD, University of Michigan. His uh, master's is it your master's thesis? Well, my, my, my PhD dissertation, dissertation was on this topic. It was, was on yeah. this topic, so something he knows very well, in which we'll all get to learn about basically the history of predation. Uh, Forrest's postdoc was at the Smithsonian, and if I were to list all of Forrest's published papers and research projects, we would be here till 8 o'clock, and he wouldn't get to talk. So <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Please it's not that bad. In welcoming Forrest God. It's not that good. No. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation to come over here. Uh, it's always a great excuse to uh, come to Jackson Hole. It's a great place to be. Um, today I am talking about some of the work that uh, I've been focused on really in many ways for the last 20 years. I've dabbled in questions related to parasitism and also predation on crinoids. I actually uh, got interested in crinoids uh, growing up in Burlington, Iowa, which uh, some people have called the crinoid capital of the world. And uh, while I was in high school, actually, I decided that I was going to uh, pursue geology, specifically crinoid paleontology, uh, really for the rest of my life. And um, the topic that, uh, again, I want to share with you today is parasitism and predation on crinoids. Now, when most people become familiar or exposed to crinoids, they are typically in this form. Um, before they ever know of them as living things, um, you know, many people, at least in this country, who are familiar with crinoids uh, have encountered them as these broken up bits and pieces, little Cheerios, if you will, that are found inside of rocks. Um, fewer people are aware, however, that these little bits and pieces uh, combine together to create a very interesting organisms. And uh, crinoids, I think, are among the most confused organisms uh, in, in many ways. I mean, historically, they've been interpreted in many, many interesting ways. Uh, so I thought it's, it's worthwhile just to address sort of what are crinoids. You know, crinoids, of course, as I'm sure all of you know, are marine animals, uh, even though they look like plants, um, even though to some they look like uh, petrified squirrel heads or snakes or, you know, a, a number of other things. Uh, crinoids are animals and I think one of the easiest, easiest ways to conceptualize them as, is as an upside down starfish on a stick. It's one of my favorite uh, descriptions. So crinoids are echinoderms, they're related to starfish and if you were to take a starfish and flip it upside down such that its little arms and sucker feet are, are extended upward and the mouth is, is on top um, and then you allow those arms to divide many times and then put it up on a stick up into the water column where those little tube feet can intercept food particles in the water column, uh, you essentially have a crinoid or, or an upside down starfish on a stick. <laughs> As I mentioned already, crinoids are animals. They are echinoderms. Um, they have a nervous system. Uh, there are boy crinoids and girl crinoids. They have a mouth, they have an anus, they have a complete digestive system. Um, and uh, they actually run seawater uh, through their bodies. Um, and as a consequence of that, they're strictly marine organisms. Uh, there are no freshwater echinoderms. There are no terrestrial echinoderms. It's one of the few phyla of animals that actually stayed in the oceans. Um, there are five groups of living echinoderms, you know, crinoids, uh, and, and, uh, which are also sometimes referred to as starfish or sea lilies. And then, of course, you have ophiroids and asteroids, echinoids, and holothurians. These are the five major groups of echinoderms that are present in today's oceans. And uh, as I've mentioned, you know, crinoids, they're often referred to as sea lilies, 
if they still possess a stalk, such as this one, um, but most of the species of crinoids that are present today actually detach from their stalks. They autotomize them, kind of like a, a lizard is able to do with its tail. It just releases its tail. Um, as they're juveniles, or when they're juveniles, they release them, that stalk and they live a relatively free living life. Um, they're able to crawl around more effectively, they're able to swim, um, but most of them lack stalks. Those that do are referred to as feather stars. Now, sea lilies and feather stars both um, serve as hosts to a variety of organisms in marine environments. So in this particular uh, image, you can see an, a, a beautiful example of a crinoid arm with a very well camouflaged crinoid shrimp hiding on one of those arms. This group of shrimp um, lives only on crinoids and uh, specific species of shrimp live on specific species of crinoids and the color mimicry is just absolutely fabulous. You might want to look at these online sometime. There's just some really great examples of, of crinoid mimicry of camouflage. And just about every living crinoid in modern marine environments show some evidence of either parasitism or predation in the form of missing arms or other body parts. So this is an example of a crinoid that is now on exhibit in the Smithsonian's Ocean Hall. Um, this is a, a great example of a fossil that shows evidence for possibly both parasitism and predation. So here, for example, you can see a little cone-shaped object that is actually positioned over the anal opening of the crinoid. Uh, it is a snail that is perched over the anus. Um, another example of parasitism is seen on the opposite side of the same specimen. If you look at these arms, there are swellings in these arms. There are little galls that are present in the arms. You can see another one up here. Uh, we see similar galls in extant crinoids. And then there's also evidence on this specimen for relatively small arms, relatively diminutive arms here. And then you can see where there's a truncation along this arm and, uh, and regrowth above that truncation. So remember that crinoids are related to starfish. And like their starfish cousins, they have amazing regenerative capabilities. Uh, crinoids can suffer pretty significant trauma and then repair that damage, regenerate that damage to such an extent that you can't even tell they were ever damaged in the first place. And so when we look at, when we look at the fossil record, um, we see a really rich history of evidence of biotic interactions in crinoids that persists to today. And this gives us an opportunity to look at the effects of parasitism and predation in one group over literally million year time spans. Um, crinoids have been around since the early part of the Ordovician. In fact, I brought an early Ordovician crinoid with me today. Um, it's a specimen from Idaho. And uh, if anyone would like to see it, I'd be happy to show it to you after the presentation. But I really, again, want to talk about two things. One, parasites, um, or the potential for parasites, and two, predatory uh, interactions. The first I want to talk about is, is perhaps one of the most famous interactions preserved on fossil crinoids, and that is crinoids and uh, infesting snails called platyceratids. Uh, this is the body of a crinoid or a calyx. You can see where the arms would have attached here, and this is where the stem would have been. On top of the crinoid, again positioned over the anal opening, you can see the anal opening here, uh, is a snail. And interestingly, when this interaction was first discovered in the 1800s, and when natural historians really didn't have a really good concept of crinoid biology, that opening was often interpreted, that central opening, which we now know as the anus, was often interpreted as the mouth. And when people found these snails within the arms of a crinoid, they thought they had found evidence of a crinoid grabbing a snail and eating it, right? It grabs a snail with its arms, it sticks it over its mouth, which is actually its butt, and it, and, it, and it begins consuming it. But it didn't take long for them to look a little bit more closely, to, to, to observe a little harder 
to note that if you look at the snail, the, the growth margin of the snail looks like it is form-fitted to the crinoid. Also, um, this is an example, so this is a silicified specimen. This is the top of the crinoid, this is part of a snail here. This is a scar that is sitting on top of the crinoid. You can actually see, this is the anal opening again, and these are growth lines from that snail that are impressed upon the upper surface of the crinoid. Um, and another thing that I think is important to note, these things also have a coincident geologic range. So these snails and these crinoids, this particular group of crinoids that they seem to prefer, show up in the Ordovician and, and both of them get wiped out by the end Permian mass extinction. Um, but let me do say one more thing before I move away from this slide, and that is again that, that these snails seem to prefer a group of crinoids called cameret crinoids. They have these really big boxy bodies, and I'll be speaking about that more in a moment. But let me again just recap this uh, sort of coincident stratigraphic range. So the first crinoids, in particular this group, the first cr cameret crinoids shows up in the early Ordovician. Shortly thereafter, we see two genera of cameret crinoids that are infested by snails. And you can see how that pattern changes through time. It really peaks in the Mississippian. So in the Mississippian, this group of crinoids reaches its zenith. We also see the highest number of genera that are infested by these snails. Uh, there's a bit of a, an extinction at the end of the Mississippian um, that uh, really coals both camerates but also this relationship between camerates and their infesting snails and then again as I mentioned both go extinct at the end uh, both camerate crinoids and these snails go extinct at the end of the Permian however it's important to note that crinoids themselves do not go extinct you know this one group does and a few others but crinoids themselves persist so again what's the nature of this interaction um, you know, sort of after the whole carnivory idea passed, uh, crinoids eating snails, um, after that idea passed, probably the leading explanation, and an explanation that you still find quite commonly today, is that the snails were simply sitting over the crinoid anal vent or the paraproct, and they were feeding on the waste generated by the crinoids. Some have even proposed that it was a mutualistic interaction, that the snails were actually helping prevent the crinoids from fouling themselves. So, so by, the, by the snails keeping the crinoids clean, uh, they weren't refiltering their own waste. Uh, and, and so that's, that's also been an explanation that's been set forth. However, some have also suggested that this interaction was detrimental to the crinoids. In other words, it was parasitic. Perhaps these snails were stealing crinoid gametes. Uh, that would be, of course, very negative for reproduction. Uh, or they may have been stealing their nutrients. They may have been directly stealing undigested nutrients from inside the crinoid. And so, in a nutshell, you know, the debate is, the question is, is are these snails commensals? They have a, just basically no negative effect on the crinoid, kind of like a moth might have sitting on an oak tree. Uh, or are they parasites, like a tapeworm might have, you know, a negative effect on our guts, right? Are they, are they parasites? So demonstrating parasitism in the fossil record uh, is a little bit tricky. Because in order to demonstrate parasitism, you have to demonstrate gain by the infesting organism, but also loss by the host. Uh, and so let's actually take both of these in turn. Let's first look at what the snails might have been gaining or evidence for gain uh, uh, in this sort of perhaps parasitic interaction. So this is a model actually generated by my PhD advisor uh, sort of looking at the energetics of this interaction if it were parasitic or if it were predatory. So let's say these snails are actually like some modern snails do. Uh, they'll, they'll drill into prey and they'll, they'll eat them, or they'll, they'll eat, eat prey items. Um, if they just sit on, on, a, on a crinoid to, to prey upon it, uh, well, you can see here that the, the energy gain is quite low. Um, just to make a, a long story short, what this information suggests is that the snails, 
would actually gain the greatest amount of energy by parasitizing crinoids, and in particular, by parasitizing crinoids that have the ability to gather large amounts of food. Um, crinoids that have very dense feeding filters. Let me explain. So this, this is an example of a variety of groups of crinoids with increasingly dense feeding filtration uh, arms, really. So I mean, if you think of a crinoid, uh, you can think of really it as, as, a, as a filter in many ways. It's filtering the water column for plankton and, and nutrients and so forth. Um, this crinoid uh, has very simple arms. Uh, they become uh, finely branched in, in this particular group, the cladids, and then very finely branched in this group, the cameric crinoids. And so cameric crinoids have the greatest filter density, the greatest capacity to both generate collect food, but also to generate waste. I mean, if you're just after the waste, uh, it is the camera crinoids that are also are going to generate the most waste. So we can kind of look at this in, in this way. We can say, well, we can look at the probability of infestation and uh, its relationship to filter density. And generally speaking, and I think the, the, the results are pretty obvious here, and as I mentioned before, it is cameric crinoids that are the preferential hosts for, for these snails. And so from this perspective, it appears that, that, that you know, they're basically infesting the group of organisms that is most likely to give them the most nutrients. This is also an interesting one too. So for the most part, when we find snails that are infesting crinoids, it's usually one snail per crinoid. So these examples are fairly unusual. So they're hard to see here, so there are line drawings, but on this particular crinoid, on its oral surface, there are many small juvenile snails, none of which has yet found the paraproct, or the anus. In this second specimen, you can see that there are still many snails, um, but they are, they're concentrated around that paraproct, and the snail that is sitting directly over the paraproct is significantly larger than any of the other snails on top of the specimen. So it seems that these snails are falling out a spat, they're settling out of the water column on suitable hosts and uh, perhaps competing for that preeminent space uh, on that, on that paraproct. So there does seem to be com competition for that particular uh, region. And I think another thing just that's, that's worth noting is you know, generally, these, these snails are choosing the crinoids. Uh, it's, it's, it's clearly of some benefit to them. But are they harming the crinoids? Are they having any negative impact on the crinoids? And so one way to assess this question is to look at a single population of crinoids, um, perhaps a single population that was buried by the same storm event, and look at the, 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 the differences between infested and uninfested specimens. And so that's what we did with a couple of, of different individuals, or a couple of different uh, horizons. And so this is, this is one of those horizons that we looked at, a crinoid from the Devonian uh, called Gineocrinus. Um, in this particular case, we had about 395 individuals that showed no evidence of infestation by snails. But we also showed, or we had about 30 individuals that were infested by snails. And that distribution pattern is very interesting because the infested snails are significant, or sorry, the infested crinoids, the snail infested crinoids are significantly smaller than their uninfested cohorts. This suggests that it is a negative interaction, a detrimental interaction, um, you know, for, for the crinoids. Another thing that's really interesting about this particular study, this particular crinoid, is that this is an example of the largest uninfested individual. Um, this is an example of the largest infested individual. It, it's kind of strange, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, but we don't see any large crinoids in this particular population that have snails attached to them. 
And so what seems to be happening in this case is that these snails are settling out of the water column on potential hosts and they're growing with their hosts. There's a very strong positive correlation between snail size and crinoid size. Uh, it, it's host size, essentially. Um, so here's, here's an, so th this suggests again that it's, that it's more of a parasitic interaction rather than a commensalistic one. There's other evidence for this also. So this is the top of a crinoid. This is its oral surface. And this is the anus or the paraproct. And note that the anus of that specimen is covered by a bunch of tiny little plates, right? And so if the snails were actually drilling into, or if the snails were actually getting into the inside of the crinoid somehow to, to gain nutrients, um, then uh, they would have to get through those little plates. And in this particular specimen where we see the scar of the snail sitting on top of the crinoid, uh, we see those paraproctals missing. And in fact, the, the anus itself looks to have been modified perhaps by some action of the snail. Uh, this is also an interesting one. Remember that I mentioned that for the most part, we just see one snail per crinoid. This is an example where we see uh, on a single crinoid, two infesting snails. And so the question is, is what is that second snail doing? Well, uh, you can see here that there is a large hole in the side of this specimen. This particular crinoid had a snail on top of it. It also had a snail on the side of it, just as you see here. You can actually see growth lines from the snail uh, that have modified the, the calyx of the crinoid. And you can also see that the crinoid, while it was live, was trying to heal this damage that it sensed in the side of its body wall. It kept sending you know, material to this and it generated kind of a big donut-like ring. The snail was keeping that opening available or open and uh, the, the crinoid just kept trying to heal it. It generated kind of a swelling around the damaged area. So this gives us some insight also into what they are targeting. Um, this is just kind of a fun little model, uh, a, a CT, a micro CT scan of a crinoid and some of its internal anatomy. Um, if you look at the inside of this particular specimen uh, and it's going to rotate around, you can see there's this very large central organ in, in the animal. And as you look toward the top, right at the top of that organ, so all of the food converges right at the top of that organ. And so again, think of it as a, as a bunch of conveyor belts running down the arms to that central, central mouth that is inside the crinoid right about here. And so all of that food is being transported to a region right here uh, near, the, near the hindgut of the crinoid. And uh, well, it makes sense that, you know, if you're after nutrients, that would be the ideal place to target. It's where the nutrients are being concentrated uh, and, and so, and so it, it, perhaps they are, they are targeting the nutrients there inside the, in the crinoid. Um, so interestingly, on some crinoids, some groups of crinoids develop these really long tubes uh, on their oral surfaces um, called anal tubes or anal chimneys. And so on this particular specimen, uh, this is a very elongate tube and the anus is the very tip of that tube. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a chimney-like structure. All the way back in 1888, uh, a guy by the name of Keyes proposed that perhaps these tubes evolved as a response, as an adaptation to these parasitic snails trying to steal their nutrients. And uh, interestingly, I mean, I've looked at hundreds and hundreds, if, if not thousands of specimens and I've actually never found a snail attached to the distal end of one of these tubes. Uh, that seems to be pretty effective, right? I mean, so, so never do we find snails attached to the ends of these tubes. However, we do find snails attached to tubed crinoids. Um, they are sitting right at the base of the tube again, right on top of the main body of the animal. They're sitting right at the base of the tube. And uh, as you might have already guessed, you know, what are they doing there at the base of the tube? Uh, they are drilling holes. 
Um, so so the, the, the crinoid puts the anus way, way, way up here on the end of that tube, and the snail says, well, I don't care. Uh, I'm just going to drill a hole through you and, uh, and take the food that I want anyway. And so you can see a drill hole here. I actually brought uh, some fossil examples if any of you are interested in them. Uh, this is another example. So you're looking down at the top of a crinoid. Uh, this is where there was a snail once sitting. This scar was generated by the snail. Uh, this is the anal tube. This is the base of the anal tube. And there's some nice specimens of this particular species sitting on the table over here. And this is a drill hole that is about six millimeters in diameter. And so again, this hole would have given them access to that concentrated region of undigested nutrients uh, inside the crinoid. See, they seem to be targeting that region of the crinoid. And this is a beautiful specimen uh, that has been serially sectioned, basically cut and demolished uh, by my PhD advisor. It's a great specimen. So these are the arms of a crinoid. Again, think of it as a thin section, basically. This is the anal tube. Oops. This is the snail sitting at the base of the anal tube. And this is the drill hole uh, produced by that snail. So you can kind of see it all right there. So even though snails can still infest crinoids with tubes, could perhaps the tube still be advantageous to the crinoid? Could the tube still deter infestation by snails? Um, and could the tube actually help increase their digestion, diminishing the negative effects of this parasite stealing uh, the nutrients? And so one way to address this is to look at one related group of crinoids, um, some of which have tubes and others that do not have tubes, and look at the frequency of infestation of the tubed versus the tubeless forms. Those data are here, and uh, the pattern is, is remarkably clear. Um, you know, basically 23% of the tubeless specimens are infested whereas only 4% of the tubed specimens are infested. This suggests that having a tube uh, is advantageous. It reduces the probability of infestation. It discourages infestation. You know, if you think about it from the snail's perspective too, it's easier for the snail to probably not have to drill through that thick anal tube and the thick plating around it. Um, they get much easier access to that zone of concentrated nutrients uh, if the tube is absent. Also, that tube's just kind of in the way, isn't it, uh, of growth and so forth. And so another question that we can address is even though snails were infesting tubed crinoids, did they minimize the negative impact of, of infestation? And so generally speaking, based on that earlier work, we might have an, a, a hypothesis that infested individuals would be significantly smaller than uninfested individuals under a model of parasitism. And so what we did was we looked at a population of crinoids from the Mississippian of Alabama, um, about 198 individuals, almost 200 individuals, 161 of which were infested, 31 uh, which sorry, 161 were uninfested, 31, 37 which were uh, infested. Um, and we looked at the size differences. And, uh, and our results weren't quite as we expected. In this particular case, uh, the infested individuals were actually bigger than the uninfested individuals. And, um, and significantly so. What's up? What's wrong? No. The, the, did I say something wrong? No, no. Yeah, yeah so, so the infested individuals were actually bigger than the uninfested individuals. And so that made us go back to the drawing board just a little bit. Um, and let me, let me articulate a few things really quickly. So under a model of commensalism or neutrality, um, generally speaking, the snails would have no impact on growth rate the crinoids growth rate at all. If it's completely neutral interaction, if it's commensal, you're not going to have an impact on the growth rate. Otherwise it's, otherwise it's parasitism. 
So if you think about this, the largest crinoids are going to be also the largest targets. So if you think of this spat settling out of the water column, just from a probabilistic perspective, what are they most likely to settle on? They're most likely to settle on the bigger crinoids. Also, you can generally assume that the bigger crinoids in a population are also the oldest crinoids in a population, which it would have given them more opportunities to be infested over their lifetime. And so generally speaking, it is the largest crinoids that should have the highest rates of infestation. So under a model of neutrality, it is the large crinoids, it's, it's the infested crinoids that should be significantly large for those two reasons. Um, larger crinoids should always have higher infestation rates under this model of commensalism. Under a model of parasitism, um, the parasite will reduce the growth rate of the host. This should minimize the difference between the larger infested specimens and the smaller uninfested specimens. And, and, and I think this is really important that even under a model of parasitism, the average size of infested crinoids could actually be larger than the uninfested crinoids. It is only in cases of extreme detriment are you going to expect the the infested specimens to be significantly smaller the un than the uninfested specimens. Again, because generally speaking, it is the infested specimens that should be significantly larger. And so let me uh, just sort of summarize this here. So we looked at this in a model. And generally speaking, um, this is uh, the, the size relationship of crinoids and snails if the interaction were commensal. These represent modeled size relationships under a regime of increasing detriment, increasing intensity of, of parasitism, if you will. And this line represents this observed population that we were looking at in Alabama. Note that the observed population, even though the infested individuals are significantly larger than the uninfested individuals, the observed population fits in that window of, of a parasitic interaction. The, the, the larger specimens, the specimens that are infested, are still smaller than the expectation under a model of neutrality. And, and so that, that changes the paradigm just a little bit. So sort of summarizing this a little bit. Infested specimens in this particular case, in the tubed case, are smaller than they should be under a model of neutrality or commensalism. Um, this is consistent with the idea that the presence of the tube not only served to discourage infestation by these snails, but it also minimized the negative impact of parasitism, perhaps by lengthening the gut. So as you, as you extend your gut, your intestinal system, through that long tube, you're allowing for more nutrients to diffuse through that digestive system. You're lengthening the digestive tract. Um, but, but overall, and, and in summary, I think this example of this platycerated or the snail crinoid interaction is one of the best examples of evolutionary escalation that we have in the fossil record. Because again, in summary, here you have a group of snails that is infesting a group of crinoids. Um, perhaps in the beginning that was a commensal interaction, but at some point at least, evidence suggests that it became parasitic. Uh, and, and again, in evolutionary escalation, it's kind of an evolutionary tit for tat. You do one thing, well, I'm gonna respond to it, and, and so forth. And in this particular case, well, the, 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 the crinoid said, well, hey, if you're going to infest me, I'm going to just put my, my butt at the end of a long tube, now try to get it, right? And they say, well, if you're gonna put your butt at the end of a long tube, I'm just gonna drill a hole through you and get what I want anyway, 
Um, and so, it's, so again, it's this, it's this evolutionary arms race that we see between these two groups of organisms um, that I think is very interesting and, uh, and fairly well documented within this group. And I'll throw out one thing also that's, that's interesting along this same line uh, as, as a conclusion to this part of the talk, and that is there's also some evidence that these snails, if they infest their hosts when their hosts are young enough, they might actually suppress the development of the tube altogether. So here is a specimen with a very large snail sitting at the base of a tube. Uh, here is a specimen with, a, it almost looks like a little conical hat, you know, sitting on top of this crinoid. This crinoid should have a tube, but it's not there. Um, the snail is sitting over the top of the specimen. Uh, you know, there should be a big tube coming right out through the middle of the snail, but it's not there. So it's possible, as we've seen in some other places under scars, that uh, they might even be producing a little bit of an acid or they might be producing something to impede the development of the, the calcite plates uh, under, under them and perhaps suppress tube development. So that's infestation. That's this uh, example of infestation in the fossil record, this platycerated crinoid interaction. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but first I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about regeneration, predation. And in particular, um, there are two major marine revolutions that are often identified in the fossil record. The first is called the Mid-Paleozoic Marine Revolution. And generally at this time, we see an increase in plate thickness and spinosity in a lot of shelled marine invertebrates. And this is thought to be the consequence of an increase in the diversity of shell crushing predators. So generally speaking, um, the Middle Devonian is thought to be a time in the oceans uh, when the oceans became increasingly dangerous. Um, we were ramping up predator-prey interactions in the Middle Devonian and prey are responding by again getting thicker plates and spines and so forth. The second major revolution in marine ecosystems, marine ecosystems is often considered the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. And, and this is largely associated with the diversification of modern groups of fishes. Um, and in this particular case, during the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, we see the appearance of crinoids that mostly live without their stalks. We also see the displacement of, of stalked crinoids into relatively deep water, deep lightless water. And so people have suggested that perhaps this marine revolution, during this marine revolution and the diversification of these fishes, you know, crinoids had to adapt or die. Um, you know, basically get, get, uh, get cold. And if we look at modern crinoids, there's a lot of evidence for organisms interacting with them, perhaps fish, perhaps other organisms. But if you look at living populations of crinoids, most of the individuals in any given population of living crinoids will show some evidence of regeneration. Here's a beautiful example from the Smithsonian's ocean hull. You can see these entire rays. Think of two entire starfish arms. They've been removed and, uh, and they're regrowing. This is also a beautiful specimen. You can see where the truncation took place, this, this pattern, uh, different, different coloration pattern here. And this is a specimen that's just really been hit hard too. But modern crinoids, again, show a lot of evidence of regeneration um, and, and a lot of ability to, to recover from that. Um, but let me step back here just really quickly. Remember that many characteristics of fossil crinoids have been explained as a consequence of predation especially predation by fishes. The only problem with that is despite the abundant evidence for regeneration in living crinoids, until about the last you know, 20 years ago, there was very little evidence of regeneration in fossil crinoids. So you have all of these things that are being explained as a consequence of predation and the evolutionary and ecological history of crinoids, yet the fossils suggest here's a paper by Oji in 2001 and he's basically compiling all the evidence of regeneration in fossil crinoids. He has about a dozen examples and that is it across the entire fossil record about a dozen examples and this was just again in 2001. And so you see the problem. Um, we have very scant evidence for, for you know predatory interactions on crinoids in the fossil record. 
Yet we're going to explain most of their morphological, a lot of their morphological evolution and ecological evolution as a consequence of predator-prey interactions. It doesn't work. Um, this is a good example of this. So remember the mid-Paleozoic marine revolution. This is a beautiful example of a crinoid from the middle part of the Devonian that just gets remarkably thick and spiny. I mean, you know, it could be, it's almost like a moose. <coughs> you know, there should be one outside of the bars here in, uh, in Jackson Hole or something like that. It's the moose crinoid. Um, this is where its stock would have been, by the way. But you can see that it's very spiny, and a lot of crinoids do this beginning, notably beginning in the middle part of the Devonian. And this is coincident with, again, an increase in the diversity of shell-crushing arthropods and shell-crushing fish. Basically, animals that specialize on crushing shelled invertebrates and extracting the soft parts, eating the soft parts inside them. Signer and Brett in this famous paper in 1984 in which they proposed the mid-Paleozoic marine, marine revolution said, look, you've got this correlation between increased diversity of, of predators, shell-crushing predators, and thicker plates and spines among shallow marine invertebrates. Uh, they're probably related. Uh, the problem is, again, where's the evidence of regeneration? And so this is one of the things that I've been interested in for a while. It's one of the things that I did for my PhD, in fact, is I looked at, uh, I don't know, 2,500, 3,000 individual specimens that uh, essentially span the early part of the, or mo most of the Paleozoic, um, but also include the Devonian when this middle Paleozoic marine revolution was thought to take place. So the first thing I needed to do, remember, in 2001, there were 12 known examples of crinoids with regenerated arms. And so the first thing to do is just to start looking at specimens very closely to see if there was any evidence of regeneration in them at all. And so that's what I started doing, looking at these really well-preserved faunas through time. And everywhere I looked, every single fauna, I found regeneration and lots of it and some really interesting examples. And so here's an example of a specimen that had lost all of its arms from the Ordovician. And you can see that they are starting to grow them back. This is also a very interesting specimen from the Devonian of, of uh, Canada, actually. Uh, you can see um, that it actually lost four arms. It lost four arms, but it regrew two in the place of every one that it lost. Kind of like, you know, a hydra or something like that, right? You're going to take off four arms, well, okay, I'll grow back eight. Um, here's also, this is this specimen that we saw before, this beautiful example of, of regeneration from Crawfordsville, Indiana. And then this is a specimen from uh, the Silurian of England that is, is twice bitten. Um, it shows two, two evidences of, of damage and, and regeneration. And notice how, notice how clustered these are. This clustering is, is somewhat consistent with a bite, right? A single, a single bite. Um, but here are the data. So the nutshell here is that during the Devonian, we see a threefold increase in regeneration frequency. So, so not only two, two major points. One is that regeneration in the fossil record is actually fairly common and much more common than had been previously recognized. And two, in the Devonian, there is a huge spike in regeneration frequency. Now, there's one thing that I failed to mention that I should probably uh, do so. I probably should mention this, that, that generally speaking, um, among living crinoids, there appears to be a positive correlation between regeneration frequency and predation intensity. So the higher the regeneration frequency, uh, the greater the number of attacks on that population of crinoids. And so we can kind of use this as a proxy for predation intensity in deep time, in the fossil record. And so again, we can generally interpret these data as suggesting that the frequency of attacks on crinoids during the Devonian increased threefold, and then it stayed relatively high thereafter. Uh, so this is consistent with Signer and Brett's middle Paleozoic marine revolution, the idea that the oceans were becoming more dangerous for shallow marine invertebrates. Let's take a closer look at just one of these faunas. This is one of the most famous faunas of, of crinoids from the fossil record, um, the Legrand uh, fauna from Iowa, Mains Creek Formation. 
uh, just absolutely beautiful and spectacular specimens. I mean, if you're going to find evidence for regeneration, this is going to be the place. I'll also mention that this is time equivalent to the Mississippian rocks that you see in this local Teton area. Uh, you can actually find some of the very same species here in the Tetons that you do in this La Grande fauna in Iowa. But anyway, I looked at, at, at these specimens very closely and um, generally speaking, about 9% of the individuals showed evidence for regeneration. Um, but, but also very interesting, it is the most abundant species in the fauna that showed the highest regeneration frequency. Average regeneration frequency was 9%. This one species showed 27%. 27% of its individuals showed evidence for regenerated arms. This is a significant difference. Um, there's a significantly high, perhaps even evidence for selection, right? Selectivity for this particular taxon for some reason. And one of the things that's really interesting about this pattern also is that as you, if you look at the size distribution within this species, if you look at specimens, that have cup heights, just that little body, the height smaller than seven millimeters, there's only a 5% regeneration frequency. But if you look at individuals that are above average size, over 50% of the specimens that are above average size show evidence for regeneration. And there's another interesting element to this. So not only is this Rhodochronides, Kirbii, the most abundant crinoid in the fauna, and it is the largest individuals that show the highest regeneration frequencies, but it is also the crinoid with the longest stalk, which you may assume meant that it was sitting the highest above the ocean floor. And so you have a very abundant, perhaps a very apparent crinoid, the most obvious crinoid in this particular fauna shows the highest regeneration frequencies. This is very consistent with something that we see in a lot of the uh, plant literature called the apparency hypothesis. The general idea behind the apparency hypothesis is that the most apparent plants, you know, however you're measuring apparency, are going to show the highest degrees of chemical defenses against insects and, 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 and other organisms, um, whatever might be trying to exploit them. And, and, uh, and, and so this is somewhat interesting because the last surviving member of this lineage, so again, if you're going to get attacked a lot, well, maybe your population is going to adapt to those attacks in some ways. And the last surviving member of this lineage is this thing, Rhodochronides barisi. Uh, well, it looks like a little uh, moon lander or something like that, but, but uh, it's, it's very spiny and very thick plated. It's the last surviving member of this lineage, which is also consistent with, uh, with apparency theory. All right, let's move on uh, just quickly to this second marine revolution, which is uh, the Mesozoic marine revolution. And again, during this time, we see the appearance of swimming crinoids and stockless crinoids, crinoids that are able to crawl around and hide during the, in the reef during the day and come out at night to feed. Um, we also see the displacement of stocked crinoids forever into the aphotic zone, right? In, into the deep ocean. And um, some of the evidence for that displacement came for this great paper by Botcher and Jablonski. And so what they did is they essentially looked at crinoidal deposits. They, so this is, notice that this is the Triassic running through uh, the, the tertiary, the Paleogene and the Neogene, recent even. And these dark bars represent places, environments in which stocked crinoids are present. These stippled bars represent places where they have a taphonomic control. They represent places where crinoids should be present because other things that have higher preservation probabilities are preserved there, but where they are absent. And notice this pattern. Essentially in the early Cretaceous, the late Cretaceous, uh, crinoids are no longer present in shallow marine environments. Stocked crinoids are no longer present in shallow marine environments. And again, this has been explained as a consequence of fish predation the diversification of teleost fish.
Um, one of the adaptations that we see in a lot of these living groups of crinoids are things called autotomy planes, again, just like lizards have in their tails, um, for perhaps escaping predators. For, so for example, if you look in the stalks of, of a lot of living groups of crinoids that still have stalks, uh, and this is what the stalkless forms do too, remember when they're juveniles they have stalks, but they can literally just shed their stalks. They autotomize them, they, they drop them. Um, and also in their arms, there are specialized planes in the arms, just like a lizard's tail, if you tug on a crinoid arm, it will naturally want to detach along those autotomy planes, those, those adapted zones of, of weakness, uh, of release, if you will. So we see this in crinoids. And the ability also of modern crinoids to autotomize their stalks gives them this ability. Perhaps some of you have seen this video. Um, this is a, a wonderful video of a stalked crinoid, a kind of paradigm busting video of a stalked crinoid if you haven't seen it. Oops, that's the next video. Um, see if I can get it here. There you go. And so that's a stalked crinoid that is, that is using the muscles in its arms to crawl around. They can literally autotomize the distal end of their stalk and then move. If they're fixed somehow, they can get rid of that distal portion of their stalk and start crawling around. Um, also, of course, the, the living uh, feather stars that detach their stalks purposefully when they're very young. And this is a, a pretty grainy video just from our aquarium on campus. Um, you can see that uh, it has the capability of swimming. It's, it's quite beautiful to watch them swim. Um, but again, one explanation for this swimming ability, this swimming behavior, has been as an adaptation to escape from fish predators. I want you to think about that just for a minute. I'm sure there are some fisher people in this room, right? Fishermen and fi fisher women in this room. Um, what does this look like to you? Kind of looks like a lure, right? I, I mean, in many ways, I, I, a, a, a crinoid is not going to be able to escape a fish, uh, you know, behaving in this way. In fact, it might even draw attention to itself um, as it's moving around in the water column, uh, looking like a lure. Um, but again, that has been the long-running explanation for why crinoids swim. Um, let me show you this, though. We do have evidence for fish attacking crinoids. Uh, this is, uh, again, from our aquarium on campus. And this is a crinoid that I just got, well, I just got it out of a FedEx box. Um, but, but recently before that, it was, it was in the South Pacific. And uh, so this is a crinoid that just came in from the wild. And uh, I want you to notice how this Melanurus wrasse, the fish that's taking interest in the crinoid, uh, responds to it. This is the, this is the Melanurus wrasse here. Watch what it's doing. It's very curious, very interested in this newly introduced crinoid. And in a moment, and this is, this, this is very rarely caught. I mean, we don't have very many examples of, of, cry, of, of crinoids being attacked by fish, but there you go. You just saw that, uh, that, that Melanurus wrasse bump that crinoid, and it's going to do it one more time. Um, but again, it's very interested in it. But notice how precise its attacks are. It's not uh, just sort of, you know, very aggressively going after the whole specimen. There it goes again, attacking this crinoid. So fish have, have largely been recognized or hypothesized as you know, a very aggressive predator on crinoids. This particular fish, for example, uh, the clown triggerfish, has actually been observed in the wild attacking and consuming whole crinoids. And so we purposefully grabbed one of these fish, put it in a research tank on campus, and we tried to feed it crinoids. So if you feed this fish silver sides, basically little minnows, you throw them in the tank and it aggressively goes after them and takes them down. But if we tried to feed that fish, almost, every, you know, it's basically trained to come to the surface of the water wherever we, wherever we put our hand there and it would just devour those silver sides. But then we took pieces of crinoid arm and we put them in the water for that fish just like we would a silver side. 
it put it in its mouth and immediately spit it out. And so then we tried to trick the fish. We took little silver sides and we, we gutted them and we inserted a crinoid arm inside the fish and then we gave it the fish and it would attack the fish very aggressively and then, you know, ugh, kind of have, 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 a, have a bitter, bitter look on its face and it would spit the fish out and then it would grab the fish and spit the fish out and grab the fish and spit the fish out until the crinoid arm separated from the fish and they would eat the fish and ignore the crinoid arm. And so this doesn't sound like a fish that would anxiously consume a crinoid. And again, actual observances of, of crinoids being attacked by fish in the wild are very, very rare. And so generally speaking, um, the fish, even the, those that are observed to be aggressive or suggested to be aggressive, will spit pieces of crinoids out. And so why do they attack crinoids? Why are they attacking them? We just saw that Melanurus wrasse attacking that crinoid. Why was it doing it? Well, we kind of bring it full circle back to our, our parasitism story, right? Or our commensal story. Remember that living crinoids are the hosts to many organisms. And uh, this is a, just a little, another crinoid shrimp, again, that's beautifully camouflaged in its host. Uh, Tom and I spent about a month in, in Palau uh, looking at a lot of things related to living crinoids. Uh, these are specimens from the wild that we were examining just fresh out of the ocean. And uh, beautiful red crinoid shrimp. This is a pair of crinoid crabs, uh, a mated pair that was living on one of the crinoids. Uh, this was a goby. Oh, it is a goby. Uh, we preserved a lot of the organisms and, and the hosts that they were associated with. Um, but this is a goby that you can see the little sucker pad on the bottom of it that uh, literally uh, attaches to and lives on crinoids. Uh, you know, crinoids are just this wonderful little micro ecosystem for a lot of organisms. This is a polychaete worm that we pulled out of a crinoid. Um, this is a, a special group of polychaetes called mysostomes. It's a whole group of essentially worms that live only on crinoids. And you can see this one, uh, it even has a little appendage that mimics a pinule, a feeding branch on the arm of a crinoid. And uh, these things are pretty, uh, pretty brutal actually. So this is the top of a crinoid. Uh, this is, these are the arms coming in. You can see the food grooves. Uh, all of these are transporting food to the mouth of the crinoid. And look what's waiting where all of, this, all of this food converges. There's a mysostome there, 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 there. They're all over the place. But another very important thing to note is that some of these mysostomes stick out much more than others. And so even when we get these from the wild and we bring them into the tank, they're full of commensals. And what that Melanurus wrasse was looking for and was attacking was not the crinoid, but it was attacking the things that are living on the crinoid, the little juicy bits, right? I mean, if you think about crinoids, they're basically just made out of limestone. Uh, would, you rather eat, would you rather eat a handful of limestone or a shrimp? Uh, I, and I, I think it's, it's pretty clear, right? We're, we're chordates too. Uh, so again, there, there's, there's this example, I, I, I don't need to, show you that again, but it's, but it's going after these little, little shrimp. And other things that are living on them. <clears throat> so just a, a couple of quick things uh, as, I, as I close up here. Um, another thing to consider as a crinoid predator, and this is something again that has just developed over the last couple of decades, and it's an unexpected development. That is another crinoid cousin, the echinoids. Uh, and their nasty jaws, right? Those, those Aristotle lanterns, that Aristotle lantern that you can see right there in this diadema. So in our tank on campus, um, for, for quite a while, you know, we, 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 I've kept crinoids for many years in there now, uh, probably eight or nine. Uh, we've kept some individuals for up to three years. Um, but for a while we were keeping crinoids and sea urchins and I wanted to have every group of, of echinoderms in the tank just because I love echinoderms. Well, that turned out to be a mistake um, for a crinoid lover um, because as it turns out, uh, echinoids will very aggressively consume crinoids. Again, another grainy video. Uh, this is one from campus, but right here, if you can make it out, so this is the underside of an echinoid um, and this is a crinoid arm that is heading into its mouth. 
uh, and if you watch it, we won't watch this, well, it's not that long. But anyway, it, it almost looks like it's sucking in a piece of spaghetti. It's almost yeah. dexterously manipulating that piece of arm uh, as, it's, as it's drawing into it, it, drawing it into its mouth and it's consuming it. So the fish ignored crinoid parts. The sea urchins eat them very, you know, very excitedly. They, they, don't, they, they like them, right? They'll, they don't have any problems eating crinoid arms. And uh, we saw this uh, play out naturally also in the aquarium. So uh, this is one, my, one of my, one of my uh, aquarium TAs called me and said, you know, oh gosh, you got to come up here. This is, this is really cool. Um, there was a sea urchin that had pinned down an otherwise very healthy crinoid in the corner of the aquarium. And it, was, it, had, it had it pinned down. It couldn't move. And when I got up to campus, by the time I had gotten up to campus, a lot of it had already been pretty munched. And so I thought this was really cool, essentially natural behavior. And so what I did was actually took the two of them and gave them their own private room. And uh, I set up a, a recording device underneath the tank so I could record the interaction from below. And I have about eight hours of time lapse that's condensed into, I don't know, five minutes or so. Here's some stills from that. Um, over again, about a time of, I don't know, eight to 12 hours or so, you know, including the time that I missed uh, at the front end, um, this sea urchin consumed this entire crinoid. And it was really cool to watch because the sea urchin would consume this crinoid and it would bust it apart with its Aristotle's lantern. And then you would generate these volcanoes of tiny little crinoid bits. You know, it was, it was, it was getting stuffed with crinoids, so stuffed with crinoids that all these crinoid bits were rapidly passing out of its, out of its anus and generating a halo of crinoid bits, which is what you can see all around here. These are all pieces that have already been processed through the digestive system of the echinoid. And um, we took a couple of echinoids and let them eat some crinoid pieces and then preserved the echinoids. And, uh, and you can actually see undigested, even articulated bits of crinoids still inside the echinoids. And in fact, if you look at these crinoid pieces that have passed through echinoids, they leave these very diagnostic scars where the Aristotle's lantern has punctured the crinoid bits. And what's really fun about this also, so we see this in these living specimens, but what's really cool about this is that we also see these same kinds of marks going back all the way to the Triassic. In Triassic rocks, where we first see these groups of sea urchins and where we first see these groups of more mobile crinoids starting to appear in the rock record. Now remember, this increased degree of mobility in crinoids has long been explained as a consequence of fish predation. But it seems much more reasonable for reasons that we've already explained that this increased mobility was a consequence of predation by echinoids. And, uh, and that is basically summarized here. And for crinoids, remember the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, that Botcher and Jablonski paper that we looked at suggested that crinoids started to see the effects of the, of the revolution in the Cretaceous as they started getting displaced into deeper water environments. Um, but these fossils suggest that crinoids actually started to experience the Marine Mesozoic Revolution, or the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, all the way back in the Triassic. Um, returning very briefly at the very end here to the Middle Paleozoic Marine Revolution, tying all of this together. So remember that during the Devonian, in the Middle Paleozoic Marine Revolution, crinoids start to get super spiny. And this is an example of this same crinoid that has a huge gaping hole in the side of its body. Not a very good image here. Um, but you can see that that hole had started to be repaired. It started to basically add little plates to fill that hole. You can see where plates that have been cleaved have started to regenerate. You can see spines that have also been truncated and have started to regenerate. It's very unlikely this was generated by an echinoid back in the middle Paleozoic Marine Revolution. Um, some, some shell crushing predator uh, likely took a big bite out of this crinoid started to repair itself, and then it died before that repair was complete. Um, but I think it's worth considering again, were 
the fish or were the predators, the shell crushing predators actually attacking crinoids? Or were they attacking things like those snails that are living on the crinoids? And the crinoids were just being damaged collaterally. So here, for example, is an, exam is an example of a crinoid um, a, a car called Arthrocantha that has just a tremendous number of spines all over its body. It has them on the arms. But notice there's a snail up here that also has these just remarkable spines on it. And just again, to, to make a long story short, we looked at the relationship between crinoid spinosity and snail presence over time. And there's a significantly positive correlation between the presence of snails on crinoids and spines and thick plates in those crinoids. Um, which, which is c consistent with the idea that these crinoids um, were getting targeted by shell crushing predators, not necessarily for the crinoids themselves, but they were getting targeted because of the, the things that were living on the crinoids. Um, they were experiencing just collateral damage. And so, generally speaking, um, crinoids in the fossil record um, and modern crinoids also all show wonderful examples of biotic interactions, both parasitism and also predation. And one of the wonderful things about this system is that, again, crinoids have been around. They've been in the fossil record for about 500 million years. And so given the fossils and the living specimens, we really have a lot of opportunities to test hypotheses about the impact or the effects of parasitism and predation on one group of marine animals. You know, so if we look at crinoids past and present, um, if we look at crinoids, for example, like this Dory crinus from the Mississippian of Iowa, it has a very boxy, thick, heavy calyx. You know, it would have had a lot of soft internal anatomy here. And it's defending that soft part anatomy with very thick plates and with spines. But at some point as the prey continued to develop, uh, that was no longer an effective escape strategy uh, as, as, again, new kinds of predators evolved. And so if you, if you look at this, modern day crinoids is a beautiful example of a modern day crinoid from Palau. It has no stalk. Um, it's much more mobile. It has a very reduced viscera. Um, and again, it has the ability uh, to crawl and perhaps also has toxins uh, in its tissues that ward off predators like fish. And so, to, again, just a, just a wonderful example of, of an opportunity to, to study uh, an evolutionary system uh, over a very, very long period of time. And uh, I thank you for your time. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm happy to open this up to questions. I also am happy to uh, discuss any of the specimens that are on the table. Remember also that I have this, uh, this wonderful new species and genus from the early Ordovician of Idaho that I'm happy to share with you. I'll also just mention something uh, briefly. It's kind of a little a plug of sorts, um, but also just... Uh, something else I'm willing to talk about. So I'm actually working on a, on a book project right now um, related to uh, kind of how the US grew up uh, alongside science in this country, how science grew up with a country um, using, using crinoids as the primary uh, example, the thread through it. And uh, I'm hoping um, that, that I'll have the, the first draft finished by August. Uh, it's a lot of work trying to write a book um, but uh, this is certainly something that I'd be happy to come and, and talk to you about uh, at, at some future date if you're interested. Kind of a history of science kind of a talk. All right, any questions about crinoid predators questions and prey? Yeah. For far us here, and certainly <coughs> I really strongly suggest that you come up and ask him about what's up on the table. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to answer questions as long as you have them. Um, where, where I was, I was going to put this as a backdrop. Yes. I'm wondering about the range and size. The range and size. So that's a great question. Um, crinoids range in size from essentially microscopic. They're microcrinoids. Uh, 
Um, a lot of these are probably juveniles. Um, but the largest crinoids are actually from Germany. Uh, the Jurassic of Germany, there's a crinoid called Cyrocrinus that grew to about 60 feet. The, the stalk itself is probably only about as thick as your thumb. You know, it's, the stalks weren't that thick, um, but they got very, very long. And uh, again, about 60 feet long. Yeah. Those are the biggest crinoids. I was just curious, you, you had uh, mentioned that up until um, around 2000, I guess, that there was very little evidence of regeneration. Yeah. All of a sudden, you, you found there's a lot. Yeah, there is quite a bit. So what was responsible for that? Just better? Just looking. <laughs> Yeah, just looking systematically, right? Just looking systematically. I think, I don't think ever anyone ever really looked systematically for regeneration in, in fossil crinoids. Um, they, would, they would be looking at specimens and say, oh, here's regeneration, that's cool. In fact, there are several papers that, that are just simply about, hey, wow, look, I found one example of a regenerated crinoid and it was worth a paper at that time. Certainly not worth a paper anymore because it's actually really common. Okay, that's nice. You know, there, there are a lot of examples of regenerated crinoids now. Hundreds and hundreds. Whereas in 2001, that, that represented all the published examples of, cri of regenerated crinoids, fossil crinoids. Yeah. Here's a critter for sure. Yeah. Not terribly complex as an organism. Are there other creatures from this earlier area, years that can regenerate? Is there any causation or DNA or something that you can point to? This is why it developed, this is what it is, this is why we're studying it, etc. Are you speaking specifically about the fossil record well, or fossils? Well, I mean, if you were studying regeneration at either era, right. What does it take? What does it take to either create it and can you get some of that information from the fossil record? Um, first of all, I'm not 100% sure I understand your question, regeneration but has been for a long it, time. regeneration has been around for a long time. Regeneration is, is especially uh, common in, in crinoids, in echinoderms, right? So, so there are a lot of other groups of organisms that we even see as fossils you know, brachiopods, clams, arthropods, you know, things, things of that sort that, that, that can show evidence for damage and subsequent healing. Um, but one of the great things about echinoderms is that they can survive very extreme trauma and, and not only repair that trauma, but regenerate from that trauma. It takes a while for that regeneration to take place. So for example, the crinoids in our tank, if they lose arms, takes them about nine months to completely regenerate those arms. Uh, to, to the extent you don't even realize they had ever lost them. Um, and, and the great thing about these fossils is that they can be preserved in the act of regeneration, in that act of, of repair. You know, you don't see it to such a, a clear extent um, in, in most other groups of organisms. You know, both living and, and fossil. And so this really does provide a really nice group in which to, to study something like this. I mean, regeneration, you know, regeneration is, it happens in chordates too. You, you take off the limb of a salamander and it can completely regenerate. Um, you know, and I, I was at a regeneration conference many years ago now where a doctor was showing um, kids in Africa, typically under the age of five, that if they'd lost a digit, uh, you know, in the United States, what do we do? we try to rush them to the hospital and get it sewed back on, right? Maybe put it on ice, try to sew it back on. They would just put some gauze over it and uh, in children under the age of five, they would completely regenerate their digits uh, with you know, tendons, bones, muscles, even the fingernail would regenerate. Uh, we lose that ability again when we're relatively young, but even humans, which are not that far removed from echinoderms, we're all deuterostomes, um, have, have some of that regeneration ability. But again, just with respect to looking at, at a regeneration system within a group of organisms over a very long period of time, you know, a group of organisms that has good preservation potential, I can't think of a better group than echinoderms.
uh, and crinoids were just so abundant, especially in the Paleozoic, that they provide us with ample opportunities for gathering data in a group that has the ability to regenerate and, and preserve that regeneration very obviously. Yes? Yeah, so the Paleozoic in particular is a, is a time when crinoids were incredibly abundant, um, especially the Mississippian. And here in Wyoming, especially in the high mountains, you know, uh, the Teton Range, the Gravants, uh, several other ranges nearby in, in Montana and Idaho, uh, near the tops of those ranges, there are a lot of Mississippian rocks. The Mississippian is often referred to as the age of crinoids because they were just so abundant at that time. And, uh, and pretty much anywhere around here where you can get into those Mississippian rocks, you're gonna find crinoids, even, even articulated crinoids. Uh, and probably, probably, so the Mississippian in the Jurassic and Triassic in this area, you can also find some nice remains of crinoids. And uh, the Ordovician too, some of the local Ordovician rocks have really nice crinoids in them also. Uh, the most common species is probably one that's known in the literature right now as Platycrinides bozmanensis, and uh, no, named for Bozeman, Montana. There's actually a, a partial specimen that I think Mike brought in uh, from, from the local, local rocks that, that is of that species. But yeah, it's a, it's a fairly common species. Oh yeah, there, there's Mike right there. Here and ask Forrest a few questions about what's up here. Before we do that, a couple of things. Um, we break out the usual grill if you would move chairs to you know, either side of the room, we would be very much appreciated.